Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Tanya and I'm the editor of The Internationalist. Today we are joined by Matt Kennard, who's an author, journalist and co-founder and the head of investigations at Declassified UK. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me. So today Matt and I are going to discuss his recent book, Silent Coup, How Corporations Overthrew Democracy, which he's co-authored with Claire Provost. This book is an incredible insight and result of Matt and Claire's reports from 30 countries around the world, looking at how corporate entities dictate governance and justice. Um, Matt, throughout your career as an investigative journalist, you've delved into the complex and often, often controversial intersection of corporate interests and aid funding to political corruption. And I see that detailed in Silent Coup when you map the historical journey from colonial era chartered companies to modern corporate players asking critical questions about ethics. So my first question to you is, can conflicts of interest between profit-driven corporations and the altruistic goals of aid be mitigated? And is the 0.7% GNI targets as used by UK a meaningful metric given how aid funds are spent and who benefits from them? Yeah, uh, well, it's a good question. And to answer the first one uh, about whether corporate um, profit motive can sit with the uh, stated altruistic goals of aid, I don't think it can. And I think that the whole conception we have of aid um, is wrong. Uh, and that includes the left because there's not many critics of aid on the left in the mainstream. There are sort of on the fringes, but in, in the mainstream, it doesn't really exist. There's still this idea that aid is a transfer of wealth from the, from the rich countries to the poorest citizens of the world. That's just not true. And that was one of the major revelations I had during the research for this book, where we went to all um, five different continents and 30 countries, as you say. And it was very, very strange to come across um, uh, capitalist uh, endeavors. So a mine or a uh, agribusiness um, uh, project, whatever it would be, nearly always I'd find that it was funded in part by aid. Um, and I just didn't realize that before I started the, the research that the aid uh, uh, industry was it, is primarily about helping Greece the entry of corporations into new markets and also about enshrining a specific development model in those countries which benefits corporate power and benefits foreign investors primarily. So that was a major revelation and then we, uh, uh, after the reporting projects well, we did, myself and Claire, we started looking into the history of it. And you realize quite quickly when you look at the history that this is how it was designed. Um, that the, 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 the economic system that we have now globally was really put down in 1944 at Bretton Woods uh, in New Hampshire, when the US and UK primarily negotiated the sort of post-war economic settlement. Uh, and that was the conference that created the World Bank and the IMF. And then in 1947, a couple of years later, they created the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which later became the WTO. Now, those three institutions um, really govern um, pretty much how most of humanity runs their economies. So they're majorly important. And what you realize is that they were put down by the US and UK essentially to allow the free movement of uh, primarily Western corporations into the developing world and also to stop, this was the start of the Cold War as well, uh, and the threat of communism, to stop uh, countries going to the communist side. So it was all about enshrining uh, capitalism. But um, I would say that um, uh, for the first 20, 30 years, it did work uh, quite well in terms of uh, uh, growth rates around the world um, uh, um, and also equitable distribution of that growth as well. But that kind of all got uh, smashed up in the 70s and then 80s with a sort of neoliberal turn in these, in the, in these institutions, what were called structural adjustment programs where loans and um, aid and bailouts were predicated on 
doing certain things to your economy and is what's called neoliberalism but essentially it's things like the menu of policies that you have to in, in, implement are things like deregulating um you, your economy um getting rid of capital con controls getting rid of subsidies for for goods and services which benefit the poor um getting rid of any tariffs so really integrating yourself into the global market and not really uh, allowing uh, any kind of policies which benefit the domestic economy but just orientating it for the the global economy so it's important to understand that this uh, this kind of uh, uh, aid and the word development that industry was developed uh, at this time to to do this stuff so the what i saw when i was reporting silent coup and the the huge involvement of um the world bank particularly in in corporate in corporate projects um is not surprising when you know the history um it's surprising to people when you you say this uh to to people who are, haven't looked into it because it goes kind of against what you'd imagine is uh, uh how capitalism runs because capitalism we're told is about um corporations taking risk uh, and getting rewards based on on that risk they might lose they might um they might not they might win but this system ensures them against loss uh even when they do lose they can get bailed out or they can get cheap loans that mean that they don't have the same risks that they would have normally so i'll just give you an example i went to a agribusiness project in um tanzania which was uh kicking loads of peasants that had been there for generations off their land um and then i found out that it was being funded by the norwegian aid agency um and uh, that they, they could give me no proper explanation of why they needed aid money to go there um and there it's a very very strange um ideology that they they, they promote to say so the aid agencies will say well <clears throat> we need to uh, development is all about attracting foreign investment it's all about attracting corporations to go to new markets so we need to help them go to places they wouldn't otherwise go um so you have this massive infrastructure that corporations can can tap into that allow them to go around the world and basically get cheap loans and get funded by taxpayers because the world bank is funded by us uh, uh, uh global citizens also uh, uh, uh the national uh, development agencies uh like diffid in the uk and usaid in the us they're also funded by taxpayers so taxpayers are subsidizing corporations to go around the world and and really um pillage the resources and and um uh the of, of the developing world um so yeah uh, i think aid needs to be completely reconceptualized as uh, an, an an arm uh of the imperial um project essentially and also i'll finish with this there's another element of this which is that it's also it's not just a subsidy to corporations uh and it's not just uh, a method of allowing corporations to enter new markets and locking countries into this neoliberal economic model. It's also about exerting geopolitical control. So aid is used to bribe governments to um, make them enforce certain policies um, and make them uh, uh, bring them over to alliances with certain governments. Um, so I do quite a lot of work in my day job at Declassified about the aid, um, uh, the aid budget in the UK. And I've just done countless stories of how aid's being used to subvert the, the, the government in Venezuela, for example, or to um, to to support the Bolsonaro uh, government in Brazil when he was in power. Um, you see this across the board that aid is being used to enforce the geopolitical uh, uh, goals of the of the British government, and that, and it transposes over to all governments really. Um, so aid is not a altruistic thing it's in the interest of governments to do it um and in the interest of corporations which is why um it, that someone like david cameron who is not a um progressive in any sense um but he famously um said that uh, uh, when he was prime minister that he wanted to um get the uk to uh, uh commit 0.7 percent of gdp to aid for the world's poorest apparently he did this while he was hammering the British poor with his austerity program 
uh, the, in one of the most harsh um, programs in in modern British history. Um, they reckon 150,000 people may have died because of that austerity program. So those things don't sit, do they? He's not do he's not hammering the British poor and then suddenly becomes super benevolent about helping the poor around the world. But but of course he's not. The reason is because that 0.7% of GDP is not about helping the poor around the world. It's about helping his friends in the corporate sector and about helping the British state enforce its geopolitical control. Um, so, but what I've, the, the, the description I've just given it, you don't hear it in the mainstream, even in the left. So we need to uh, reconceptualize aid, understand that it grew out of the fall of formal colonialism, replaced it essentially with altruistic sounding words like aid, like development. Um, but really, it's a cover for uh, the same dynamics. Um, imperialism never stopped. It, it changed and it had to put on a new mask. Um, that's like that's quite true. And as I was reading your book, it did sort of struck me um, when you talk about, for example, the water uh, colonization in a way in Manila in your book. Um, and when you talk about who it is actually supposed to profit, um, not the people of Philippines, actually. And, you know, this complex relationship between colonialism, corporate interests, development, and considering the evolution of institutions like IFC and CDC, which essentially began as development focused entities, but, you know, now they've expanded into profit driven ventures. Mm. How can we? foster a more equitable and people-centered approach to international development, you think? Um, are there any changes you think that are needed to ensure that development initiatives prioritize social impact and community well-being above all else? Yeah, well, I mean, the top line from me would be you need to shut down the World Bank and the IMF and make something better and make something that is um, intended to be better because the goal of the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO is not um, um, the stated goal, which is uh, to, well, the World Bank's is to the alleviation of global poverty. That's not their goal. They might tell themselves that they might tell the world that but that's not their goal. Their goal is to ensure that the uh, rule of the 1%, the rule of corporations is enforced around the world. And you mentioned all, the IFC, which is the International Finance Corporation. It's a very, very good example of how they do it. Um, that was created in 1966. Oh, sorry, 1956. Um, and the, the goal of the IFC was to uh, start investing in private companies. So before that, um, the, the World Bank had mostly been about transferring of um, money to governments. So they said we should invest in the private sector. Now, they said it was because, like I said before, the ideology is, well, we, the, this will help development because countries need investment and this will help corporations that might not otherwise go to new markets, go to new markets because we'll give them cheap loans and non-commercial loans. Um, but it, it, essentially, it was about bumping up, supporting and promoting the private sector around the world and stopping uh, governments doing things differently. Um, and... I, I don't think we need this aid. I think what we need to do is support governments which are actually um, going against these aid organizations. So for example, you could have 200 years of IFC loans and uh, IMF bailouts um, and all these things that you meant that, that happen to countries which come under the control of them. And you get no progress like you would get, you got un, in Bolivia under Evo Morales um, from 2006 to 2019. He completely transformed the society because he was a liberation leader that worked in the interest, the economic interests of his people, democratically elected, not in the interests of international capital. And that is what we should be supporting. We should be supporting liberation governments which are trying to kick out these institutions because these institutions are not the answer, they're the problem. So um, I, my, 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 my take is we know what works in development. We know what works. We know if, you, if, you, if, you're, if the criteria is um, uh, 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 alleviation of poverty, um, uh, equitable, equitable distribution of work, uh, growth, um, uh, um, 
development in health, education, all these things. Look at places that have done it successfully. Bolivia is one example. Ecuador under Rafael Correa, another example. Um, uh, these are places that had massive uh, progress under these leaders. And how did they do it? They did it by stepping on the toes of corporations. You can't make your society uh, more just, more equitable without stepping on the toes of corporations and behind them step the people that the, the hidden fist of those corporations which is the US military and NATO essentially in Latin America it has traditionally been so you need to and 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 actually Hugo Chavez said this when he was in uh, it, when he was president of um Venezuela he said look i have nothing against the united states um or or the world bank or whoever it is but with my program there's no way I can enact that without stepping on the toes of the empire, what he called the empire, and it is an empire. So I, so, and that is true. You can't do it. And in fact, the empire eventually supported a coup in Bolivia, uh, e even though they made all this progress in 2019. The next year, a democracy was was reinstated. So my my take is, if you want to, uh, if your goal is alleviation of global poverty, if your goal is a more just world, a more progressive world. We need to support liberation governments which are going against the uh, uh, Bretton Woods institutions because the Bretton Woods institutions are offering a menu of policies which are a disaster, mostly, wherever they're practiced. And also, they are only, they're meant to benefit the richest people in the world. They're not meant to benefit the poorest people in the world. A huge amount of propaganda is, is created within these institutions because they have so much money. They have a lot of money that they can pay uh, academics and and other and, and analysts to write papers which support what they're doing, but if you kind of clear all that away, it's just a, another uh, a, a form of economic imperialism. So we need to shut them down, in my opinion. It's interesting the BRICS Bank, isn't it, um, which has come along recently, and uh, I don't know how that's going to going to go because it's members of it. Someone like Modi in India, as you know, it is a is just a, a, a massive shield for the cor for corporate power in India. But BRICS Bank is an interesting idea in that it we need alternatives to the Bretton Woods institutions and the Bretton Woods institutions should not be reformed. They should be shut down. That's yeah. I mean, that's totally true about Modi as well. I mean, we see that in India uh, with big corporations like Adani and the Ambani's, you know, taking over a lot of our public infrastructure. And that was also the basis of the 2020 farmers, um, you know, movement that happened in India at such a large scale and, you know, mobilized entirely, almost everyone together. Um, so my next question has ties to the earlier one, and I was hoping you could perhaps briefly introduce for our readers how specifically the special economic zones, which we read about in detail in Silent Coup, connect with big historical events like you've just mentioned, um, you know, like the colonial rule, the Cold War's conclusion, or even the 2008 financial crisis, and what's the impact on the workers' lives and rights, you know, economic development and political autonomy, especially in regions like Hong Kong um, that are transitioning from colonial rule to new economic paradigms? Yeah, I mean, the, the section on special economic zones in Silent Coup is part of a wider look at, at the privatization of physical territory. Um, how bits of territory are now being chiseled off from the state by corporations. Kind of the emblematic example of that is a special economic zone, but it also goes for private cities um, um, and pr uh, private um, uh, uh, housing facilities, I mean, and, and private uh, 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 what are called export processing zones, which are similar to a special economic zone. But so you're seeing we saw this all around the world. And they're often funded, special economic zones, by aid agencies because aid agencies see them, like the World Bank, as a and regional development bank, see them as a way of uh, countries developing, um, and and they think that's the only way you can develop is to 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 create these what what we call corporate utopias. So um, a special economic zone uh, is is a place where corporations can operate without having to often abide by the national laws of the country. So they don't have to pay the minimum wage. This isn't with all of them, but this is the kind of model. You don't have to pay the minimum wage. You don't have to pay 
uh, export and import and export duties, those kind of things. Um, and as you say, again, it was they developed at the same time as as uh, institutions like the IFC. So the first one was is said to have been created in Ireland, actually, in 1959 in a place called Shannon, which we went to. But really, the Special Economic Zone took off in Asia. And actually, the first one in Asia was in in um, India. Uh, and I went there, actually. It was in a near a place called Gandhi Dam in Gujarat. And it's called the, the Kandla Special Economic Zone. So when I went there, that was created in the 60s. It was quite interesting because they... <laughs> They said, uh, I went into the special economic zone and went into some factories and stuff and found workers working and interviewed them and stuff. But that, that I also interviewed the people who are running Candler special economic zone. And they said to, I said to them, what are the benefits now for the corporation that is inside your SEZ? And they were basically like, there's no difference now to the national government because many of the sort of corporate friendly policies that were trialed in Candler and were operating there for many decades are now the national laws of India. So this is what, what you often see with the special economic zone is that, that they trial neoliberal extreme forms of capitalism in these special economic zones and then roll them out on a na nationwide uh, um, uh, 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 scale. Uh, and that is what we call in the book a special economic world. And essentially we're living in a special economic world now um, where national governments have to um, try their best to attract foreign investment as the ideology is that's the only way you can develop. And the best way to attract investment is to get to have the, low, the lowest standards for environmental regulations, the lowest minimum wage, the lowest tax on co corporate tax rate, all these things that we need, that we think of that we need for a civilized society. Corporations hate that. So, so there's a what they call the race to the bottom globally to attract investment. You have to create a kind of wasteland of a country to, to attract that investment. But the SEZ, so the SEZ were in Asia began in Kandla. And then in 1980, uh, China opened Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, um, which is now millions of people live there. It's the, well, one of the biggest in the world. That's on the border with Hong Kong. We went there too. Um, and uh, essentially, it's just hyper capitalism. So it helped the Chinese um, uh, government because the Chinese government is obviously a one party state ruled by the Communist Party. They didn't want to. Um, uh, in, in, empower the private sector to a point where they would uh, be a problem, uh, the power imbalance would be a problem for the state. So these kind of special economic zones allowed them to have this hyper capitalism within these kind of, uh, just in, in these very defined uh, places. Um, and Shep, and to go to what you were talking about, the um, the conditions for workers in these places, that it's awful often. Like Shenzhen we went to and it was like, um, combination of like totalitarianism and hyper capitalism so workers there, there were cameras everywhere um, workers were scared to speak about their conditions to us when we were there um and 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 they have basically no rights um uh, within these within these places um it's it's hard to unionize and, and and stuff like that another place i went to um uh, the special economic zones was in cambodia now cambodia has been ruled by a dictator for decades, but um, uh, uh, and has been really repressive of organized labor. Um, and actually, special economic zones are a real benefit for, for, for regimes like that because they warehouse workers. And when I went to Cambodia, they wouldn't let me in any of the special economic zones I asked to go in, but I got in myself. I, I didn't break in, but I went in just without someone seeing me and started talking to, to workers. And they were just extremely fearful about um, talking about their conditions. Um, and the special economic zone allows the managers of these uh, uh, factories and the regime itself to warehouse these workers, lock them off the rest of the society, lock them away from uh, independent unions that could help them organize. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of dystopian reality for these workers. And what happens is they're not allowed to organize independently through unions so what often happens is they erupt in uh, there's often like eruptions of violence where they like beat up their manager or or um smash up their machines or whatever it is because they're not there's no safety valves that allows them to independently organize so uh cambodia was a real um uh, uh, uh eye-opener for me 
in terms of what's why the SEZs are so loved by corporations because obviously there is the fact that they uh, they're corporate utopias they don't have to abide by national laws often but but another major part of it is that they allow to exploit workers in a much more um, efficient way in these places and um, and they're everywhere now special economic zones are taking off uh, I mean they've taken off uh, in Britain we're going to get 13 free points 13 free ports soon, which are special economic zones, essentially. So it's also coming back to the rich countries that created this system. But it was all it, it was also um, another interesting facet of it, which which I'll end on is that we talked to academics who had been who, who have looked into the history of special economic zones. And as I mentioned, the first special economic zone is meant to have been in Shannon in 1959 in Ireland, uh, but one academic I spoke to said that that's not actually not true. And what and the reason they wanted uh, the, the interest behind the special economic zone and the corporate interest wanted Shannon to be seen as the first the special economic zone was that Shannon was, uh, I mean, that Ireland was a neutral country um, and it wasn't seen, so it wasn't seen as a colonial imposition, the SEZ there, if it, if it began there. Whereas the in reality, the first special economic zone was in Puerto Rico. Uh, and we know the history of Puerto Rico and the United States, so they didn't want to make it seem like a colonial imposition by by create by allowing the idea that the first special economic zone was Puerto Rico, which would obviously change the the conception that many people have. But essentially, it is a colonial imposition. It's a imposition of a a chiselled off piece of territory where corporations can run riot and often not pay any tax to the central government. So you have uh, uh, poles of economic activity yes that give jobs badly paid jobs yes but they don't contribute to this to the central government at all often so you have like these you have a, a barren wasteland of a country and then these little poles of economic activity where you have like maybe shops around them and other other things but that's no way to to um uh, to organize a, a country and organize an economy uh, and it's not doesn't benefit a lot of people um I saw it also in Haiti in Haiti after the earthquake when I, I went there when I was working for the Financial Times and the, the only thing the US were trying to do was open special economic zones they couldn't think of anything else any other way to develop the country um and it's not what we should be doing you sh we shouldn't be creating these little um oases of economic activity that and just leaving the rest of the country to to burn we need to create a, a development economy develop we need to create an economy in these places where the central government has access to capital and has access to the resources of the country and can use them how they want um, and that's what these institutions don't want i mean what you been talking about reminds me a lot of the Michael Ferenti speech um, from the 1970s, I think, if I'm not wrong, where he also sort of goes into detail about why, you know, big powers like US or the UK, um, they go to the South, it's the, you know, what they call as the poor countries, because if they are, like he said this in his speech, like if they are really poor countries, what are they doing there? What is there to gain from such poor countries? And the answer he sort of arrives at, one of the answers he arrives at is, um, you know, they want to mine labor, most importantly. Mm. And, um, and I mean, from what I've been hearing, you know, all the information um, that I've also read from your book, I mean, it's clear that for, democracy to work, we need access to right information. We don't know a lot of these things, you know, that you write about, that you've spoken about. And, you know, I mean, and your book has uncovered some pretty unsettling stuff about how corporations have a surprising level of control over our political systems. You, you know, you did a study on Chile and you, you know, you wrote about how shareholders sued the government over lost profits during the pandemic. And you know, it was, it's a lot to take in. Um, you know, this is sort of a strange question. Do you think we can do anything to change it? I mean, we've seen some glimmers of hope in people fighting back, you know, like, you know, in India. Um, but can we as citizens really ensure our democracies remain truly democratic when transnational corporations wield such immense power and influence? And, you know, in the face of this silent coup, I mean, 
what role can internationalism play in uncovering and exposing these hidden dynamics to the public? Yeah. Oh, it's a good question. And it's an important question. And I'll take it uh, in a couple of different ways. So you mentioned um, not a lot of people know about this stuff. So I think one of the things we need to do is publicize and talk about um, these systems and these institutions uh, uh, and analyze them with, with facts in a way that doesn't happen in the mainstream media. Uh, and that is one of the major ways that resistance can start because the way that these institutions work is that the propaganda they put, put out about what they do, I'm talking about ones like the IMF, the World Bank, WTO, um, it's um, loyally repeated in the corporate media uh, often. There's very, very little critical analysis of what they're saying. So all the ideology about uh, we're helping the world, we're developing the world, goes straight into the uh, media, goes straight into people's heads. So we need to uh, uh, criticize these institutions and create a, a, a discourse which is different to the one they want to put out. It's difficult because, and this is a, a major part of this, is that the, the corporations, obviously they, they've got this international infrastructure they can use to, to impose their will on countries around the world, but they also own the media. So we have a, so it's very, very difficult to get a, um, a truthful, and um, critical analysis of the corporate run world in the corporate media, because it's the same interests um, that are running running the media. And it's interesting, isn't it? The silent coup, right? Uh, we wrote this book, um, oh, sorry, we published this book in May. So what's that now, like five months ago. And uh, it was published by Bloomsbury in hardback. Um, it's not been it's not a single word has ever been written about it in a main in a newspaper in britain the us uh or or australia or any other english-speaking country um it's pretty amazing isn't it uh I, I was formerly at the financial times claire was at the guardian so we're not like a, a, a super fringe people but they don't want to touch this stuff because it exposes the system on a very basic level and the corporate media you're not allowed to do that you can have you can you're allowed to cover scandals you're allowed to uncover like a personal um uh, uh, uh malfeasance by politicians or whatever it is you can do all that and that's permitted and even encouraged but what you're not allowed to do is question the whole system at its root which is what this book is doing this book is upending all the ideology that is pumped out by um by the corporate media about how our world works um so uh, it's you know so i think first of all we need to do that second of all we need to have international solidarity which progressive international are very important now they they, they do it with liberation governments which are doing things differently because as i mentioned there have been huge successes um fighting back against corporations um um, there was a Tata um, coal-fired uh, power plant that I visited in India as well as part of the research for this book. And the local community were resisting it. And it was funded by the IFC, by the way. Again, another example, so many of these corporate projects are just funded by the IFC. I, I, I don't know why. Um, Tata is not exactly a poor corporation. It doesn't need non-commercial loans uh, from the World Bank. But anyway, they got them. And they were, they were the, the, this coal-powered coal power, uh, coal um, power plant was destroying the local uh, communities fishing uh, uh, which is, which has gone back generations um, and they won though in the end because they raised they 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 raised the issue massively and fought and fought the company and fought with the IFC and um, they, they they managed to they got victories and I saw that all around the world when people fight back and raise uh, resistance to these institutions they can win um and you also can win uh, on a national government level like i mentioned bolivia or uh, ecuador or venezuela under chavez um there's way you can fight back um but you instantly make yourself a target um you saw we uh, we saw what happened to ever morales in 2019 there was a western back coup there um we saw what happened to chavez there was a coup there in 2002 um uh, we saw what happened with Correa in Vene in Ecuador uh, when uh, he was his deputy Lenin Moreno basically 
uh, went went completely against his mandate and aligned himself with the US and created a a really tragic story there. In fact, a, a, the society was destroyed after making huge advances under uh, under Korea. So it's definitely possible to fight back, and we can. Um, it's just that we need to, and we need to support the governments that are doing it, and we need to be aware of the risks and the problems that you instantly uh, that instantly arise when you do that. Um, and I would say, I'll finish with this: the major force for progressive change in human history is organized labor, and not, not just organized labor, independently organized labor. Um, and so that's. I think the basis of how we fight back every, uh, workers need to become organized and they are organized in lots of places in the world they're not where i live in the uk really um there's barely a there's, there's not a militant workers movement but um international solidarity as pi are, are, are trying to build uh amongst organized labor that is the only uh, force that has the power the numbers the finances that can fight back against corporate power because um we live in a society where there's two major power centers, which is the state and the corporation. Um, and both of them often are working together to, uh, in many places to to keep work, the organized labor down. But organized labor is the, the third pole that if it is, uh, if it's allowed to develop and if, if, if workers become militant enough, it can create a lot of problems for those other two power centers or even take on and become and enter the state uh, the state pole, pole, which happened in places like Bolivia and Venezuela and Ecuador. So it's definitely not depressing. And in fact, that that, that there was two sides to this reporting this book. I mean, as you say, it it does feel overwhelming when you see the power and the finances that these institutions have um, around the world. That is definitely true. I'm not going to give false hope to people that they're they're not super powerful. They are, but every single place I went. There was always a resistance to it everywhere, and often they won. Um, if they were, uh, if they were um, uh, 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 allowed to, because often the, in some of these places the repression is so extreme, like Myanmar, Burma, we, people get killed or put in prison for the for life for, for resisting. But there's other places where there's spaces to resist, and, and people are winning. So um, it's definitely there's there's two sides to it. There's a depressing side, which is we're talking about power that is it, it is overwhelming often, but there's also everywhere. I don't know. It must be a a, a deep in the human uh, DNA somewhere that there's always resistance. That, and this is the problem for the corporations. They want this whole system that we describe in Silent Coup and that we've talked about today to be silent and to be silenced. And they don't want people talking about it because they know the reality is it's indefensible. So they, uh, so the, uh, what I've talked about with aid, we didn't touch on um, uh, investor state dispute settlement, which is the system where corporations can sue governments, but that's another one. Um, this SEZ stuff we talk about, the reality of SEZs. Um, none of that's, they don't want anyone talking about it because it's very hard to defend when, when, uh, when they have to. Um, but we need to raise the alarm and, as, and we have a degree of um, freedom uh that we should be using uh to to raise the alarm because although yes writing stuff like this as i've said gets you marginalized um i mean we that's not that's we can deal with that you know we're not going to get shot like in some places like cambodia you get shot or you get put in prison for 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 going against corporations so i think we need to understand that we have a huge amount of privilege and we should use that to expose the reality of the corporate wrong world, to expose the reality of the institutions that say that they're developing and helping the world, but aren't. Um, and then, and supporting liberation uh, movements around the world, which are fighting back. Yeah, that was quite insightful, Matt. And I agree with you on all points. Uh, mobilization, especially labor mobilization, is one of the ways we can fight back. I mean, we're seeing that right now at Progressive International with Make Amazon Pay campaign, um, which is um, gathering support from across the world, you know? And yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, that gives you some hope, I think. Um, so, well, that's all the time we have. And Matt, I'd like to thank you once again for sharing your work with us. Um, before we part ways, I'd like to take a moment to invite our readers to share the internationalist with their friends. 
by sharing and spreading the word, you'll enable us to produce more engaging interviews like this one, as well as help build and sustain the Progressive International. Thank you and good evening.